We are in the fourth week of our worship series called Unraveled. In this series, we are exploring the ways that God is faithful in God's presence and activity in our lives and in our history in those times when our carefully laid plans just go awry, when what has become comfortable and familiar for us is dismantled, even destroyed. Last week, we spent some time learning about the nature of challenge and change. Technical challenges are those that come with a known problem and a known solution. So, for instance, if the basement at the parsonage floods, my husband and I get out the shop vac and vacuum up all of the water and make sure it gets dried out. Adaptive challenges are identified by confusion. We know that something is off, we know something's wrong, but we don't know what the problem is. And so we might try some quick fixes, applying our known solutions to an unknown problem, but the problem persists and usually even expands and becomes more entrenched. Adaptive work is engaged when we don't know what the challenge is and we don't know what the solution is. And so rather than invest time and energy in vacuuming up excess water when excess water isn't really the problem, we need to invest in adaptive work, time and energy in new learning, in experimenting, in remaining curious and adventurous, in trying and failing and trying and failing and trying again, most significantly in adaptive work. We need to surrender our old assumptions, traditions, values, and beliefs in order to have space and be open to the new discoveries and the hard and painful work of those new discoveries, exploration and the adventure. This, morning re this morning's reading is from the Hebrew Scriptures comes to us from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet, one who spoke to the people on behalf of God and one who spoke to God on behalf of the people. The people specifically were God's people, the chosen people, the Israelites, the people that God delivered from slavery in Egypt into freedom, a land flowing with milk and honey, the people who had established themselves in a community and enjoyed a life of autonomy, created lives for themselves in Jerusalem, people whose lives revolved around the temple in Jerusalem, built to honor God, and they believed to provide a dwelling place, a home for God, the one who saved them. At the time of today's reading from Jeremiah, however, the people, the Israelites, were not in Jerusalem. Their city and her people had suffered through a years-long siege, surrounded by the ruthless Babylonian army cut off from food and water. Their stockpile eventually diminished, their people weakened and began to die, and finally they were rendered defenseless. When the Babylonian army broke through the barriers and trampled through the city, they would have burned and pillaged. They would have destroyed any remaining resources. And on the way out of the territory, they would have poisoned any farmland to prevent crops from growing for the next generation or two or three. And the people, God's people, Jeremiah's people, were exiled cut off from the land that God had given them, sent away from everything that was familiar and enriching and forced to live in foreign lands. The word for this is diaspora, the forced mass dispersion of a population from its homeland. Lives, community, dreams, unraveling. It's important for us to remember that the Israelites didn't call Jerusalem home simply because it was their zip code. Home for the Israelites was where God had placed them, the place where they lived with God and with one another. And the Babylonian exile, the diaspora, not only robbed them of their homes, but of their identities, their welfare, and their understanding of their connection to God. Imagine the belief that if God lived in the temple, and the temple was destroyed, and the people scattered throughout the territory far and wide, where would there be hope? All was lost. And so this is the reality into which Jeremiah and others prophesied. As has been true of prophets throughout time, there were true prophets and false prophets. 
Jeremiah was deeply concerned about some false prophecies, some false promises that were being circulated among the exiled Israelites. These prophets, these false prophets, were probably much more popular than Jeremiah because they offered the people really, really good news. They promised a return to Jerusalem, the restoration of the temple and the city within two years. As a pastor and a preacher, I can empathize with these false prophets. Who, after all, wants to be the bearer of bad news? Who wouldn't want to be the one to say the thing that brightened the faces, that lightened the loads, that gave hope? Jeremiah, however, was not interested in false promises. He prophesied, he preached, he published letters calling the exiled people to face the truth and to live in that truth as the people they were, God's chosen people. I invite us to listen now to Jeremiah's call to adaptive work from the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is what I say, says the Lord. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and husbands, have sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. No doubt, the Israelites were positive that they knew the problem. They were not in Jerusalem, and they knew the solution. Get back to Jerusalem ASAP. And there were prophets and diviners that were happy to perpetuate that lie, the lie that they were dealing with a technical problem by promising a quick fix, what they had no power or authority to deliver, the end to all of their woes and a quick return back to the holy city. Enter Jeremiah, a prophet committed to mediating God's truth to God's people, even when that truth was confusing, even when that truth called for the unraveling of old dreams and challenged them to live into unimagined lives in a foreign enemy territory. Don't waste your lives, said Jeremiah, sitting around and waiting for the day when you return to the city. Live right where you are. Plant crops and eat. Build houses and live. Create family. Plan for the future. Pray for the strangers with whom you share land, even your enemies. If they do well, you do well. Live. I shouldn't be amazed, but I am at the way that our pandemic scriptures are reaching beyond the centuries of their original context and speaking directly into our own. When the pandemic started, I, like perhaps some of you, thought that no more would be required than some adjustments to how we served and celebrated communion. Within a week, I realized that everything would need to change, worship, congregational care, small groups, service, and I thought to myself, no, really big deal. We can handle Zoom worship for a few weeks, right? Small groups can take a little hiatus, no big deal. And the bigger organizations can take on community service for a bit. A fleet of people could send a few cards and make a few phone calls. Within a month, it became clear as every change brought on another change, brought on another change, brought on another change, that we are living in ongoing cycles of adaptive work. We are like the exiles, scattered and separated by COVID-19. We are living strange lives in a strange land that includes spatial distancing, masks, hand sanitizers, illness, death, overwhelmed health care professionals and facilities, 
risk taking essential workers. Our dreams of what our life would look like from here to eternity, unraveling, unraveling. And I, like perhaps some of you, have listened to false prophets because I want their message to be true. I'd like the dreams that they dream, quick fixes and a swift return to our sanctuaries, our neighborhood parties, our beaches, our restaurants. I want the pandemic to have been eradicated, wiped off the face of the planet. I want that so badly. Enter Jeremiah and the Spirit of God speaking through him. A sacred word not limited to the exiled Israelites, but a sacred word that speaks truth to us today as hard and strange as that truth is. A sacred word that calls us, that challenges us to let false dreams unravel and lay ourselves bare to the dreams that God continues to dream for us. What would it be like in these days for us to take this prophecy to heart? To really ask ourselves, are we wasting time? Are we wasting life waiting for the day when our lives will be returned to normal? In what ways are we denying the painful adaptive truth that normal, however we define it, is forever gone, if it ever was real? Have we, in these months of worshiping and meeting away from our beloved buildings, imagined that we have been separated from God? Traumatized by the pandemic, are we paralyzed by the death of our own dreams about what it means to be the church? I am so touched by the way that God's word to the Israelite people weaves a new life, a new way of being, and acknowledges essential elements for wholeness and living, building houses and living in them, shelter and safety planting gardens and eating what they produce, food and sustenance, taking on spouses and having children, planning weddings, love and community. God knew the Israelites needed these things to be whole, to be well, and God knew that they can be found anywhere, even in the midst of a diaspora dashing dream. God knows that we need these things, shelter and safety, food, sustenance, love and community. And God knows that they can be found anywhere, even in the midst of pandemic pitched plans. Friends, we do not want to remain so focused on the day, whenever it is, the day when our physical bodies can be back together in the same place at the same time, that we miss the life that longs to be lived right now in this moment. We are not the Israelites, but we are the body of Christ, experiencing a forced dispersion from the familiar and comfortable homeland of our way of being the church. We are no longer tucked away, surrounded by walls and a ceiling and a floor in a building, but we are exposed. And if we really hear God's word through Jeremiah, we are becoming aware that we are part of a much larger community, a global community in which we are called to live, a global community whose welfare is inextricably intertwined with our own. And of course, this has always been true, but the connection between their well-being and our well-being has been much easier to ignore when we have been separated from whomever they are. The church, the body of Christ, has been given a powerful opportunity in this time of pandemic to be as concerned about the welfare of others as we are ourselves. To give as much prayer time and service time to the others as we would to ourselves. To acknowledge that your well-being impacts my well-being. Friends, to wear the masks not because someone mandates it, but because the body of Christ is always investing itself in the wellness of others. 
and for those of us who are white, to engage in deep inner work about the racist system into which we were born, not because it's the politically correct thing to do, but because the body of Christ is always sacrificing itself for the sake of others. Psalm 137 asks a question. It's a question that we believe was asked by the Israelites in diaspora, in exile. How can we be Israelites in a foreign land? How can we sing God's songs in a foreign land? Indeed, how can we be the body of Christ when all of our dreams and convictions about what that means have unraveled? How can we begin to dream again in this season of dying dreams? How can we faithfully live the life that is waiting for us right here and right now when, if we're honest with one another, we really don't want to? Jeremiah, speaking God's truth, responds to that question, how can we be the body of Christ in this strange land of exile and diaspora. In verse 11 of Jeremiah 29, the Lord speaks. The Lord says, surely I know, surely I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your welfare, not for harm. Plans for your welfare, not for harm. Plans to give you a future with hope. Friends, we can be the body of Christ during this exile because God knows the plans that God has for us. God knows. And those plans cannot be destroyed by any exile or diaspora. God's plan is for welfare, for wholeness, for shalom, for perfect wholeness, a future with hope. May you hear the truth of Jeremiah's prophecy and stop waiting to live. May your heart be changed and your eyes be opened so that you can see the life and the love waiting right in front of you. May you, may we be the body of Christ, investing in and sacrificing for the sake of others.